Now, I would like to open the first breakout session, Global Entrepreneurship. Let me introduce the panelists for this session. First, we have Ms. Fujio Ishiguro, President and CEO of NetEar Group Corporation. And next, we have Dr. Roel Kubota, Chairman, President, and CEO, Axilla Inc. <laughs> then, we have Dr. Jiren Liu, President and CEO, New Soft Corporation. <laughs> and Dr. Dongsi Yu, CEO of Dionex Inc. This session is moderated by Mr. Alan Miner, Chairman and CEO of Sunbridge Group. <laughs> Mr. Miner, please. Well, I always like to first get a sense of the audience. So maybe we can start with how many people in the audience are entrepreneurs? Uh, there's quite a few people up front here, too. So good, good group of people who actually probably have something to say about uh, the topic today. Uh, and hopefully some of what uh, this group of panelists have to say will be useful for you as you go back and continue building your own businesses. Uh, how many in the group think of yourselves as global? Okay, so global entrepreneurship is like the perfect topic for this audience, it's good. Um, some of you uh, may be pretty familiar with these companies, but just to beyond the names of the people, names of the company, I'm just going to take one moment to give you an idea of what a remarkable panel hori -san and his team have put together for you here today. Uh, I, anyone in Japan, I'm sure, has heard of Ishiguro-san and knows Net Your Group, uh, one of the leading uh, players in the growth of digital marketing and applying web technology to business growth. Uh, it has built about a 300-person organization here doing some of the most innovative work in web design and digital marketing in Japan. Uh, Ryo Kubota, I met for the first time a few about a year ago when he was the winner of a California Japan Society and Stanford joint project to feat leading entrepreneurs in the valley and from Japan. And we struggled to decide whether he was the winner from the Japan side because he's Japanese or was he the winner from the US side because his company is over there. Uh, but uh, his company, Accusella, is in changing the way that eye drugs can be delivered. They've been working on a pill-based delivery system where drugs for eye care in the past have been delivered through injections in the eye. I'd much rather take a pill than have a needle stuck in my eye, frankly. So I hope that <clears throat> the clinical trials that are, that are approaching the end are successful. And uh, if I ever need glaucoma treatment or something in the future that, that he'll build, he, his company will have created the treatment that I take when I get to that point in my life. Um, Mr. Liu uh, is the founder of Newsoft, uh, by far the largest company, represents the panel, 20,000 employees worldwide. If you uh, Google their website, uh, it is in English, not in Chinese, not in Japanese. So building from nothing about 20 years ago, uh, starting as a professor at Northeastern University in Dalian, China, has built uh, one of China's most successful global outsourcing companies and has over the last few years been transitioning that company to offering software products and services in a variety of areas. So not just an outsourcing company, but an emerging software player globally with 20,000 employees. And last of all, Dong Sik Yu, uh, the founder of Zionex, uh, has been building in Korea a supply chain management solution that has been adopted by many of Korea's largest global companies and has won awards for the last couple of years for the business impact his software and his team have had on improving the efficiency of the supply chain of some of Korea's leading companies and has been active in Japan for some time. So each of the companies uh, and founders have experience internationally, have businesses of various sizes internationally. And like I said, to have representation on one panel here in Tokyo of a, a Tokyo entrepreneur, a Chinese entrepreneur, an entrepreneur from Seoul, uh, my hats go off to the folks at Globus who put this together. Now, the topic today is global entrepreneurship, and I want to kind of break the word, break the title down into two aspects, and first throw out to the panelists. Uh, why should we even be talking about entrepreneurship? And with as many entrepreneurs as we have in the room, maybe it's the wrong audience for that. But uh, since this does get videotaped, and I guess people on Abe's staff who are thinking about this may be referring to it in the future, what, why 
is it? What is what in society is the reason, the value of entrepreneurship? What's the impact that you strive to have as entrepreneurs? And why does it matter to someone like Prime Minister Abe to include in his economic agenda entrepreneurship and innovation as one of the three key things that the government is focused on right now? So why don't we start? I'm going to jump and kind of jump around a little bit, but maybe Kubota-san, if you could first take your stab at why does entrepreneurship matter? Um, in my mind, uh, entrepreneurship uh, matters a lot to uh, maybe Japanese economy as well as global economy because um, entrepreneurship is led by a person who has a strong passion to change the world in, in a better way by using kind of disruptive innovation. And unless you have that type of person to come up with a completely new idea of improving the society in the world, I don't think uh, you know uh, government or the uh, the world can uh, continue to grow and benefit the uh, kind of uh, and appreciate the role of new technology. So I, I think that's what it mean by entrepreneurship in my mind. Kim Song, Mr. Kim. Could you take that question next, Mr. Kim? Mr. Kim? Yeah, why, why do you think entrepreneurship matters? Yeah, I think the, yeah, entrepreneurship is, a, is kind of a, a energy for society. If we, I mean, our CEO try to make a new business to help the society, I think. But I don't know, I just started my business when I was uh, about 10 years ago. At the time, the software business, I mean, he, we the, in Japan and Korea usually get a software from U.S. or Europe. Uh, we just use it for the uh, system. But uh, when I we got the software from U.S., it was a uh, very expensive. It's not a ERP system. Supply chain management is not a big software, but it was a uh, just the software is cost about four million dollars. So one of our client buy the soft bought the software, but it, it's it's not running well. It was not running well at the time because the uh, manufacturing company in Korea is very complex. If you think about uh, selling the product more than 100 countries, so we thought we can, with other my friends in MIT, we thought we can develop the better software to uh, deliver our software to a big company in Korea. We started business at the time. I don't know, I, I, I don't have a big dream, just I started, we have a technology and we try to show our ability to the uh, world. We just, I mean, so that's what I started my business. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ichigoro-san, uh, Yu-san, do you have anything to add on why do you think entrepreneurship matters? Let's start with Fujio. Well, uh, you know, so for me, entrepreneurship is not something peculiar things. You know, for me, you know, it's just a matter of choice, you know, to, you know, just a matter of occupation. You know, someone want to be a, you know, engineer for Sony. Some, someone want to be a marketer for P&G. You know, entrepreneurship is the same. I just want to choose to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. For me, I think uh, entrepreneurship means you always can do something different with others. So especially in, uh, you don't very much rely on the environment you're living. So that means in good timing, bad timing, have money, no money, there's a market, there's no market in any time, you can find a way, you can survive. So if only few of the companies still in there, you're one of them. I think that is uh, uh, your intelligence, your passion, your currency, your openness, your uh, learning ability. Um, I kind of have same, you know, so same, you know, opinion. You know, so there used to be entrepreneurship. You know, so if we want to start up a company, you need uh, some big idea. You know, so great idea. Now you don't need it. You know, you just, you know, so can learn. You know, this is just a science. You know, you can learn. You know how to succeed. Thanks. So I was actually expecting somebody to say, well, because. Entrepreneurs drive employment growth in the society, which is the common government agenda reason for why they care. But the answers were coming from entrepreneurs. Those those are the reasons that people start. But they don't. People don't start businesses with the goal to provide a lot of employment for people in their countries. They start it with, from passion and idea. And so, the 
I think Kubota-san said it very well, as, as well as Mr. Liu, that you have an idea you're passionate about, and you want to, an entrepreneur is someone who wants to make the world a better place. And so a successful entrepreneur, in some way, uh, through that entrepreneurial activity, makes the world better. So obviously, uh, whether it's in a large corporate environment, a job choice, like Ijiro san said, in the social uh, entrepreneurship space or in traditional business entrepreneurship, that passion to make a difference that's valuable, the passion to make the world better, that, that I think is why a society we need always people to be practicing entrepreneurship in whatever uh, environment they find themselves in. So uh, it, it was, it, the answer actually surprised me. And, and I think it was a better answer than the one I was expecting to get. So thank you. Uh, because that <clears throat> that is that is why entrepreneurship matters. It's yeah, you're the you're the you're the guys who are like making the world better. So uh, I think Kim San already talked about it a little bit, but maybe if we could have the other three of you talk up, and if you have something to add, I'm sorry, Mr. Yu, yeah, uh, Dong Dong Sim, yeah yeah, uh, sorry Kim, sorry, I, 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 all of my friends from Korea are named Mr. Kim. Uh, sorry I'm about sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Su. Uh, uh, so. Um, the next question I wanted to talk about, you know, with that setting, uh, each entrepreneur comes at it with a different background, with a different reason. So I, I think often that the stories uh, from at each individual, what was it in your life, or what was the moment, what was the opportunity, the drive, the discovery that made you decide you were going to start a company? It's, it's it's a hard thing to do to even to start a company and to keep it going. Keep it growing is a very challenging thing. But what was the initial motivation for each of you to pursue entrepreneurship? And maybe uh, for me, the most puzzling one is uh, Dr. Liu, who was a, a professor at a very important prestigious university in Northeast China. Uh, and for a professor to decide to start a company rather than just continue in the academic world. That, that's an intriguing one. But anyway, if we, each of you could, in turn, uh, share with the audience you know, the, the, the moment, the, the anecdote, the story around uh, what led you to become an entrepreneur. Talking about uh, entrepreneurs, I think uh, each of them have a different background. If we're talking about my background, I grew up in the period in China it's a so dark period. In that time, we have no business school, no uh, mar marketing uh, market, no people buy software. Software is, uh, is no value. The people use it to copy the software. They are not very much respect uh, you know, copyright in that period. Uh, we are very hard to find the people, the sales people, the business management, HR, and I learned a lot of new term about HR, human become resources. So that sounds really hard. So why did you decide you wanted to do it? <laughs> you say, uh, you know, that basically it's from accident. I was a professor. I'm so proud of, I'm one of the youngest professor in China in that time. I'm 33 years old. In that time, most of professors should be 58 or 60, but I'm so young in that time. And, um, but I have a big problem uh, because I have a period to the, my study for PhD thesis in US. I'm totally polluted by American system in that time. And because uh, US have uh, a lot of money. Beautiful research environment. I'm working in National Lab and National Bill Standard in Maryland. It's so beautiful. Uh, a lot of money, uh, good equipment, and then when I go back to China, so I'm hard to use it. The difference is a big gap and uh, no equipment, no money. I have no money to, uh, you know, uh, to buy uh, that, that uh, computer and no money to spend to join some academy conference. And in that time, the professor to be businessman, they lose your face. That means you're not good uh, professor. I think uh, uh, Horu-san is, uh, Holly-san would be a good pre professor. He may don't want to be a businessman. <laughs> so I think that that is a period. But because I'm polluted by American professor from uh, Maryland University, they doing in uh, my lab in the uh, in, uh, US, uh, professor doing a lot of deal with uh, IBM uh, businessman. So when I go back and say, okay, I must have found some money. And then I found the company, Newsoft, in campus of university, 
in classroom with three people. And so it's just a curious to say uh, why the professor cannot be a success. But I first teacher, a mentor is from Japan. So I got a first warning is from him is say, the Mr. Kusizawa-san is uh, one of uh, CEO, as he's a senior, now is 84, and uh, still very, my, very respect my, my friends, and he's, uh, you know, uh, working in Japan. He gave me a first word, say, I never say any professor can be succeed to be a businessman. That word encouraged me as a scholar to working hard to be a businessman. And then we starting and to find the money, no money in that time, no, no capital. No people trust me. We have no people because no money, no people. Uh, there's no marketplace because people don't know what it means software. They ask me, buy your size and buy the weight and how to, you, you, you make the floppy disk to sell to us. What is the inside? So why we pay so much money in that time? So we make a first software, first year, we make big success, we make money, second year, we copy all the cities. So we have a very, very uh, bad period, but I'm so lucky I learned to be hunter, to find the source of food, to be, uh, you know, how to walk out from a forest, how to find the light in the dark period, how to got the people without the capital. I'm so lucky I was a professor. I use a lot of students in university. I, <laughs> I got so many, uh, you know, I train him, I just talk. I talking what is the dream of future. I talk with him, you can change yourself. I go back from US, you never been there. You can do a lot of things in this country if you just uh, working hard. You know, when the people know hope, every people believe you. In fact, in that time, I don't know what is, uh, can happen or not. Yeah. And then we're starting to do that. After six years, we become first IPO company in China. I make few hundreds million a year. In that time, 10,000 RMB means most, most richer people. But we make uh, so many million years. So yeah. I think that, that means for entrepreneurs, you have a dream, you must on the ground, you must find a way you can make your dream really become happen. Then you can, like a lot of people trust you to follow you. And then in that time for entrepreneurs, that means you can use all the resources really, really in low cost. And then you can sharing everything. I sharing all the stock with few thousands of my employee. I'm so proud of this kind of a journey when they start up. Thanks. Um, Kubota-san, you were at Keio, but your company is in Seattle, and I think a lot of people believe you moved to the United States because you couldn't get the money you needed to start your business in Japan, but I think the story is actually a little bit different. Could you tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Seattle, and, and how, when, what happened that made you decide you wanted to start a company? Oh, yes, um, maybe I start from uh, how I grew up. Uh, I was raised in Japan primarily, but it's been... Uh, just over maybe uh, two and a half years uh, in the United States around uh, uh, like fourth to like sixth grade uh, in my life. And at that time, I had the first exposure to non-Japanese culture. And I was very shocked that what I was thinking in Japan was not necessarily true. I heard from a lot of people that Japan is a great country with four seasons, nice scenery, great crops, nice food, everything, and that, that is true. But when I came to the United States, reputation of Japan was very different at the time in the early 70s. Like people thought the product from Japan is easy to break, copying a lot of things from the United States, just uh, making better but not really disruptive innovation. All that was going, and I was shocked that, wow, that's the reputation that uh, Japan has outside uh, of Japan, and I, I was shocked. Since then, I was always interested in doing something that can have a global impact that may provide that, oh, may, indeed, somebody from Japan may add value to the world and not just copying things and do something just mimicking. And that's how I started 
becoming interested in doing something global. That was the initial kind of inspiration that I had. Since then, uh, I became a doctor and ophthalmologist, and I was just treating patients every day in the hospital of Tokyo and the University, uh, Keio University Hospital. And I learned that there are so many diseases out there where there is no treatment still available. So I thought this might be a good topic using my expertise, my knowledge, my training, and perhaps makes the difference in the world. So I decided to come to the United States to do more basic research. That was the initial, initial re encounter to the United States because as you know, like uh, Major League Baseball, a lot of people who are interested in doing cutting edge science tend to go to the United States because that's where a lot of people from everywhere outside of the of the U.S. come to do the science. That was, U.S. is very unique in, the, in that they bring best and brightest people around the world to the U.S. to create innovation. And that really attracted me to um, utilize the United States as the base or, or fertile ground to come up with innovation. And then I got a job at the University of Washington, uh, eventually uh, as a sister professor, and then um, came up with this uh, innovation. And there was a good legal structure to transfer technology from the university to, uh, to, to the company under the name of Baidal uh, Law, and that helped me start the company in the US. At, at that time, I never expected my, country, uh, my company to last this long. I just said, maybe, what the heck, I'm interested in trying anything out, and as a professor, I got a deal from the dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Washington that, okay, even in the United States, there are very, very few professors start their company. They may be advisor and let somebody else run the company, but you're, yourself to start the company is highly, highly unusual because you're not expert in running the company. But I was allowed to spend at least a year having both positions, and that structure was very helpful. I, I had the limited amount of time, so it's not indefinite. Just one year, you can allow, you, there is some conflict of interest being university professor and uh, wearing a hat of a CEO. So I'll give you one year to decide whether you want to stay at the university and continue your tenure as an academic professor or you can quit and then full-time CEO. But you have to pick one nor the other after one year. You cannot be full-time CEO at the same time being a full-time professor. That was very helpful in forcing me to, okay, I made up mine after doing for a year. I felt that maybe I can make bigger difference because now, uh, until maybe about 20 years ago, coming up with medicine was pretty much impossible by just one person's idea. You have to join large pharmaceutical company and spend many 20, 30 years to perhaps may have, you, you may have a voice to come up with kind of new medicine when you are in a responsible position. But with the technology of outsourcing, deregulation, and this IT technology of communication and allowing to bring a lot of people to surround you and start the company in a virtual way eventually to be integrated. And that allowed me to start the company with just one guy's idea. I started my company in the basement of my house, but now I have about 100 people and raised more than $200 million in investment till this point throughout the partnership and also from the venture capital. And I'm very close to perhaps change the world in a better way with the idea that I had in mind. So this is an exciting moment. And I think uh, you know anyone who has a great idea might be able to change the world in better ways with just one person's idea. As long as you can gather a team of people that has talent and can help you, and technology and money, and we can do that. So it's a very exciting time, I have to say. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> One of the things we're supposed to be covering in the panel today is sort of things that the government can do to make entrepreneurship better. And there was a really interesting point that Kaputasan just made, I thought, that the, the ability to be a, a professor with your full-time professor role intact while Simon's as being a CEO for a year, but only allowing that, that, that conflicted, indecisive situation to continue for one year. I uh, think it's a very interesting idea that, uh, because particularly for biotech startups, there's so much laboratory equipment, uh, brain power available in the national laboratories or the universities of any country. Uh, and some try and keep that, the business academia or business research distinction very, very severe. And some, well, like Japan, when it opened up the idea, uh, allow for continuous indecisiveness, that you can continue to be a professor and continue to have a company on the side forever. So I, I think that 
that open-mindedness, but also a deadline to make a decision, decide which way you're gonna go, I think was a very interesting idea as different countries consider policy, particularly in the biotech space where the laboratories uh, connected to those national institutions are so critical to the research behind it. Uh, that, that, was, that was an interesting uh, point. Um, I should probably cut back my remarks because we're running out of time, uh, or the time is passing quickly. Uh, uh, Ishiguro-san and Kim-san, if you could, in your remarks about your own entrepreneurial moment, yeah, hmm? I keep, did I say Kim-san again? That's, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. I'm Korean, so there so are as an entrepreneur, teams. you have to be very flexible to the point yeah. where sometimes you have to allow the moderator okay. to, to yeah. uh, get your name wrong a few times, but then you also have to have the courage to keep correcting him. Um, okay. Okay. That's so if, yeah. if, if the two of you could also mm. touch on the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem around you. So the okay. moment you started, but also begin to shift to the next topic, which is... Um, what are some of the strengths and challenges, the benefits and challenges of starting a company in Korea, uh, of doing it in Tokyo? Mm. So briefly touch on how, why you chose to, the moment you decided to start a company, but then take us into the next topic of, okay. of the local environments for entrepreneurship. Okay, I just, uh, yeah, thank you for having time for to speak. Yeah, I, I try to emphasize the education of the school. I, actually, I graduated from university in Seoul, and I moved to the uh, school, the MIT, for my graduate studies. Before I moved to the uh, MIT, I never thought about I'm going to be the entrepreneur of the entrepreneur at the time because the university in Korea usually uh, teach me to how to do, be a good researcher or the university professor. But after, as you know, the MIT is a, a kind of a special school. It's for engineering school. All of them are uh, technology, and many nerd people are getting together to speak about technology itself all the time. But I had the school usually they emphasize the role of engineer. Role of engineer is going to be make a, using technology to be a, something new in society. So the school teach me, school told me the. Uh, management skill like accounting, finance. I learned those uh, studies from uh, MIT, and uh, the school has uh, many had a uh, lots of opportunity to meet the successful entrepreneur around the school. Probably Stanford is uh, is about the same environment, but it, it was a uh, back in uh, 20 years ago. It was a totally different environment what I studied in Seoul. So I thought I can could be an entrepreneur with my friends in MIT to do uh, using our knowledge and we can do something. So we started a business. And my business is, is to try to make you know, software for the global business of the manufacturing company in Korea. A big company, in Korean company, like uh, as you know, the Samsung Electronics is uh, doing very well for globalization of their business. So we are making software for trying to do something for uh, big companies in Korea first. Because you know, the, in this field, package software is probably the same in Japan. It's a kind of uh, the big company use the uh, foreign software to operate their business. SAP, Oracle, or they're using that domestic software. Probably we are, going to, we are the first software company in Korea. Korean software company can sell our software to big company in Korea. But the business environment is very different because the, as I told you, the Korean is not a big market. So many Korean company try to go outside and the business complexity is going increase heavily. They need some software and network or a process to operate their business. So it's a, I mean, that kind of environment is probably have some, but there is a better for manufacturing field. I think our client is have some up, give some opportunity for us to develop a very competitive software for us. So we have some market. So we have, if we have a very successful in Korean big company market, probably we have opportunity to move to the Japan or China. I believe in that way. 
Actually, the manufacturing industry, our software is heavily used in manufacturing field. So I think that China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan is going to be more important role for manufacturing industry. So I want to do something for this field. And I happen, I mean, the Korea is a kind of a big company in Korea are very, uh, try to do globalization, so I have a good opportunity to do business in Seoul, I guess. But I, I don't know, the government or law is not, for, I think the business opportunity is more important for my cases, I think. Thank you. Ishiguro, can you tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial moment <clears throat> and then get us started on the observations about uh, local entrepreneurship environments and what do you think is good and bad about uh, trying to start a company in Japan? Okay. Well, I don't know in the sense of how I can start. I, know I was raised by my parents, um, you know, very uh, flexible, you know, very to be independent. Whenever I asked some, you know, question about a big event of my life, you know, my parents never, you know, answered me. You know, so they said, you know, this is your life. You know, whatever, do whatever you want. That's the only answer I could get from my parents. But however, uh, when I graduated in Nagoya, uh, from Nagoya University, that's one of the, you know, so the big na national university, I had faced the first difficulties. That was, you know, so how to get a job. At the time, you know, so the big corporation, you know, hire only male students, only boys, not girls. <laughs> Well, that was, you know, door was totally closed. I could not open. But, well, you know, so then, uh, you know, so, well, you know, gradually, you know, so the big corporation started hiring. I got a, you know, job. But um, when I, you know, get an MBA, and you know, I, I decided to go to uh, Stanford in the MBA, you know, when I was 34 years old. Um, I love high tech. You know, that's why, that's why I chose Stanford. But... In, uh, the, the goal of my, to, to get an MBA is just, uh, you know, so the maybe better, you know, the career opportunities. But when I fly in the San Francisco airport, you know, I observe, I see the totally different, you know, air, different value. You know, if you the ask the Stanford MBA student, you know, so who want to be a, you know, who want to be a, the entrepreneur who want to start up company, 98 students out of 100 raise their hand. So they love Silicon Valley, just love to be an you know, entrepreneur. You know, they respect the founder of a small company much, much more than you know, vice president of IBM. So that was a place. So they changed you know, myself. Then I started, uh, you know, small consulting company in Silicon Valley. Um, the reason is, at the time, I got an offer from a big software corporation, but I chose to, you know, start, start up my small consulting company because at the time, I had, uh, you know, four years old son. I was, I become a single mother, um, you know, to, you know, live in the United States. So I thought to start up my company is less risky than working for a big corporation because, you know, something I deal with, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, this would be a market or this would be a competitor. You know, these things act very rational way. But if you work for a big corporation, you know, something you needed to deal with was not acting in national way. You know, you need to deal with the political in a big corporation. Decision-making process is really complicated. You know, you cannot handle it. You know, to start up a company is less, less risky than working for a big corporation. That's why I chose to be a, you know, to start up a company. Then we moved to, uh, you know, so Tokyo because you know, so the internet in Japan was very behind, you know, than in the United States. We chose, we, you know, we observed the more opportunity in Japan. That's why we moved. But 
uh, there is a lot of you know, so things we need to you know, change in Tokyo. You know, for example, you know, venture capital. You know, so we cannot raise uh, you know, big you know, money in Japan. For example, you know, Google, you know, they raised $1 billion before IPO. You know, Facebook, $2.3 billion before IPO. You know, some company in Japan you know, raising uh, you know, big money, or well, let's say DNA, that was, uh, I guess, 30 million. You know, Rakuten, 4.8 million. You know, in IT industry, to be global is uh, just the only way to be a winner. Because in IT industry, we have to, you know, be a platformer, like in Google, you know, Amazon. You know, to be a platformer in this industry, need big money. So we need to, you know, purchase you know, millions of server, we need to purchase T1, big internet access, it needs money. But in Japan, it's impossible. Thanks. All right, um, we need to give the audience time for Q&A in a bit. So we're, I'm gonna call this sort of the end of the first half, where the, the main point that I was trying to make, and I hope came through, is that there are opportunities to start businesses, there are people with the ambition, passion, vision to do so globally. So entrepreneurship is not a Silicon Valley phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. Um, and that, that probably goes without saying an audience like this, but that was uh, through their stories, uh, I hope that you began to get a, get a flavor. Uh, one interesting commonality that I noticed in preparing for today is each of them, including myself, as very young people had experience living overseas and had the, the culture shock of seeing a different culture, in my case coming from the US to Japan, but uh, and he's coming from Asia to somewhere. That, that exposure to a new way of thinking often triggers uh, discovery of new opportunities or uh, a new way of life. And so, um, not just in this group, but I've, I've observed in many entrepreneurs that there is often some experience living overseas. So for those of us who are parents and want to raise entrepreneurs, I would encourage you, like uh, Ishiguro-san's parents, to be very open-minded and encouraging of that kind of international experience for them. So in the second half, and particularly for, for this group, I'd like to tap into kind of the experience of the group, the insights, uh, to talk about what are you think, every company starts as a local company, in some town, in, at most in some country. And some companies ultimately grow to be globally successful. Some try and fail. Uh, some never try. Uh, and and uh, I'm not sure that to be a successful entrepreneur, you necessarily have to be global. But given the context of today's discussion, I'd like to get some remarks from the panel on uh, what you think are some of the key first steps to take to be successful globally. What are, what are some of the uh, challenges and mistakes that uh, you may have made or you may have seen others make in trying to expand your business internationally? Uh, and <clears throat> if there was one thing that you think is the most important to get right in order to be successful in your second or third international market, what, what is that most important thing uh, to get right to begin to be successful internationally? So just kind of with that general theme, because of time, I'm going to ask each of you just make what remarks you would like to make about uh, the challenges, mistakes, hint, basically hints for the audience. Uh, I'm assuming that many people in the audience are, as there were so many entrepreneurs, that you have some amount of a vision and a dream to be successful internationally at some point. So you know, what, what advice, what observations uh, do you have about the, the secrets to being successful uh, internationally, and uh, what drives that, uh, and and how to approach it. So it looks like you're ready to go. Come okay. On. Yeah. Um, uh, as a biotech, we always had a uh, global kind of mission in mind because there is no border for uh, medicine or disease. Wherever there is blindness, it doesn't matter where what language people speak or what nationality they are. There is a need. So we, when we started the company, we always had the global mission in mind. And how do you get there? So we really have to strategically think how to build our team to have a global mind. You have to think global, but you have to respect local because you have to be absorbed by local culture, local way of doing science or medicine or everything, government, how they pay for the medicine, all that has to take into consideration. 
So uh, what we tried is to continue to maintain the diversity of thought in the company by bringing uh, people from around the world to join our company. So we always, within our company, have this global kind of perspective in mind. That's pretty challenging because each people that we have have completely different experience that how they came about to join Accusella. So when we want to make decisions, it takes a long time to come to conclusion because they have their own perspective and what they thought was right in their own context may not be appropriate in different contexts. But providing that environment, people start to realize that maybe what I've been thinking as common sense may not be common sense. And you start to understand that people around the world may have different perspective and you get used to it. And that's very important first step to have that individual awareness that the people in the world may not think exactly how you think. What, was, what was the thing that you, the first time that you changed your opinion and learned something new from one of your uh, well, Japanese Well, as I said, because when I came to the United States for the first time, I was shocked with the, everything that I was thinking was common sense was denied every single point. And based on that experience, that was eye-opener for me that, wow, you need to be open-minded. So that really uh, helped me to think that way, and I really propagate that in the company heavily. And it, it is painful to run, it's sort of like herding type, cats type of situation. People are thinking in different way and come to uh, one unified kind of a strategy to move forward is not easy. But if you allow people to express their opinion and being heard, and not always their you know, kind of idea will be taken in, into the plan, but at least they've been heard. And by allowing that lengthy process of decision making, then eventually people own the decision. Although it didn't come from their common sense, but they know that whatever that, that strategy that we took at the time must be at least best thing to do for that region or the global strategy of the company or that regional strategy of the company. So uh, it's a painful process, but allowing that diversity of thought and fostering that and promoting that within the company is very, very important to have the uh, kind of a global um, type of operation, a global operating business, is, is at least in my experience. Okay. So op open-mindedness to integrate uh, all the best ideas from all the cultures that you engage with is, is I think, it's a very common factor of any successful global business. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Luke, sound like you're ready to add your uh, point of view. Mr. Liu. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Yu. Uh, you, you, you <laughs> we'll start with Mr. Yu. We're too close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, global, I think uh, for me, my experience is uh, you're always thinking about how to change yourself. Don't try to change the world. So it's my experience. So New South now, we have operation in Germany, we have operation in Finland, we have Romania, Dubai, U.S., uh, even uh, Japan, we have, uh, you know, three offices in here. So are, are any of those com com companies run by a Chinese expat you sent from Dalian, uh, or are they all run by local managers? Oh, if you uh, look at, uh, that's the second one, is uh, you understand you need to change in yourself, you need to change in your organization. Uh, talking about story like uh, automotive, that is one major business. So we have 200 German in Hamburg. So we have uh, some group of people in uh, in US. In here we have a group of people. We have in China we have uh, 1,500 people working that K for automotive. But we try to move our decision making for technology for R and D in Germany uh, because we do believe in automotive. German have the power to make a judgment about the technology or trends about future. So uh, it's very hard for us uh, because that, that business is uh, developed by us, we buy, uh, we, we put the money, and we want to export everything, uh, our culture, our value, but after that, we fully understand that you have no real value if you're only working in a domestic market. You have no your real culture if you don't understand somebody else. The culture have like a wine. They have a life. You know, five years wine, or 10 years wine, or 20 years wine, the taste is different because they grow. So they grow the taste because of the environment. So we need to learn to learn respect somebody else. For example, our team in Finland, in summer period, they have one month vacation. They're off their phone. You cannot find anybody in there. So uh, 
so if you want to change in their, their, their <laughs> revocation, nobody working for you. Uh, because that is their life, uh, because they have very dark period. Sunny day is a must be vacation day. So I think be, uh, we learn a lot. Our year now is around 500 people. Uh, only one Chinese who is working for connection with our headquarter in Dalian because we are a public company, we need a financial consolidate about that data. Our year, the CEO is German. And uh, I like a German to manage German, Finnish, and uh, Romania people. Uh, it's much, uh, I only manage one person. It's, uh, it's CEO of, uh, of a year operation. I think uh, that uh, you know, we learn, uh, if you don't try to learning, you don't try to benefit with the local people. So now to take some social responsibility, now people working for you. If you want to attract people, you must fully, I fully agree, very much localize. If you don't localize, you never have your global strategy. I'm, I'm going to interject here that um, the comment he just made about the likelihood of failure if you attempt to impose the headquarters culture, the headquarters business practices in each country around the world. Uh, versus the ability to succeed by incorporating each of the local countries' cultures and doing business in the way that's normal and expected in that country is very consistent with my experience at Oracle during the days when its internationals were growing extremely quickly and then the reverse when the headquarters was trying to control too much and the U.S. grew much faster than the internationals. So that <clears throat> willingness to be open-minded about the business practices in each country and to enable a local team with the trust of headquarters to build a business. It's very consistent with the patterns of success that I've seen. And, and, and my observation about many Japanese companies, uh, whether they're small startups or large ones, for some reason, uh, Kubota-san is an extremely rare uh, bird in my mind. Someone who's, who can be that open-minded <clears throat> about incorporating the ideas of other cultures and trusting and communicating with non-Japanese people in his, in his operations. Uh, it's, it, people will talk about Japan can't be successful if they don't speak English or they don't have enough money. There are many reasons people give why Jap more Japanese startups are international. I think the most common thing is this, this point that uh, Mr. Liu just made, that for some reason, uh, Japanese have a harder time than many other cultures trusting someone from a different culture to run their business for them overseas. And so that, whether it's a large corporation or a small one, uh, if, there's a, if there's a takeaway that I would hope the audience would have today, that is to be successful in global business, it, you really do need to, uh, to empower your local operations and run your local operations in the country as, as local companies, and, and uh, thank you for that. So, Mr. Yu. Yeah, so, yeah, I, 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 I want to talk about the, uh, for my, the globalization of our client. As you uh, see the Korean big company, they usually, uh, for example, Samsung electronic, electronic company, electronic, electronics, they usually uh, purchase the important part and machinery from Japan, and they are using many different manufacturing sites in China, Vietnam, even in Middle East to do business. But the revenue, I mean, the profit of the, the company is much higher, much bigger than the Japanese one. Well, I, I thought this is a very important and an, a interesting uh, period. The labor cost of the Samsung Electronics is very expensive. It's, it's not the, uh, from the labor cost. I think for technology and the money, investment money, is a, the technology among the company is getting dilute. You can buy the technology and important part from all over the world. Now it's uh, important how to you, you operate your company is a, is a very important topic for globalization. The, for globalization, the business complexity is, is, is going to be very higher and it's a very difficult to get information, get data. If you, I mean, have a, have a, some opportunity or you have, also you have a risk to do something wrong and you lose a lot of money for global, global business. So because the size of the market of Korea is a small, much smaller than Japan, many Korean companies try to build in the global network to do business. 
I think the American company has a different strategy. Korean company has a, a different way to do it. So I think the, the, the for future business of the, uh, the business, big company, the, we call the collective intelligence. How to use collective intelligence in your organization is going to be more important. And also, as I told you, the technology and invest money you can get all around the world. And how do you harness about your resource and the technology is going to be more important for what I observate to, uh, doing my business. That's what I want to mention. It. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know, Ishigo-san, whether you have ever actually tried to expand your footprint outside Japan, and if so, how that worked for you, or if you're planning to do it, uh, or well, actually, if you'd like to take a different angle on this question of how do you grow global? Well, actually, the, you know, so our company has not tried to be an international so far, because we are B2B business, and we deal with a big Japanese corporation. I think that for Japanese, you know, so the IT companies, the mistake we make is the uh, Japanese market is enough big, yeah, so I think that's that's a really interesting point because you saw in the comments before said because Korea is a smaller market, uh, in Silicon Valley we talk about the Israel model and there's many great technologies developing in Israel but the local market is so small that very quickly they come to Japan and the U.S. market Japanese market very big so. But as it's I said, not, uh, yeah. you know, so the, you know, to be a really real really, really winner in the IT industry, we have to be a platformer. So platformer to be, uh, you know, so the originally, you know, so just there was, uh, you know, international, global, because data is so important for, you know, so the, the new, uh, IT industries, you know, so in order to get the big data, big data, you know, you have to go to international, you know, since, you know, inception. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we are going to switch now to take questions from the audience for a bit, and then I think we'll come back and have each of the panelists make sort of one uh, closing remark as we get to the end. But uh, who, Carl? Hi, uh, my name's Carl Hay. I'm an independent consultant. I have a question for Kubota-san. Um, you mentioned that you're going to be a I'm just wondering, I, I believe I read an article in, in a Japanese magazine where, where you were interviewed, but do you think um, you could have this same kind of diversity of opinion and of inputs in Japan um, in your company. And I, I think that's a kind of something that we're all thinking about here is why, you know, it, was it just personal circumstances that someone like you has the company in the U.S. or did you really feel like it was better, you had a better chance of success in the U.S. than, than doing it here? And if you could comment on that. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the question. Definitely when I started the company, I never thought that the U.S., uh, in any business context, I didn't have any business context whether Japan was better or worse or uh, U.S. was better or worse. But looking back after 11 years of my endeavor running this company, I, I cannot imagine starting a company here in Japan, unfortunately, for, uh, for uh, various reasons. But the um, most important one is, uh, you know, attracting talent globally because we, we need to, we're, we're doing very unique niche science of vision research, and we have to find very specific expertise for each function that we have. We're a highly, highly multidisciplinary uh, kind of operation to create a molecule that can treat people's diseases, from regulatory, from medical, from science, biology, chemistry. There are so many aspects uh, that we need, and it, it is pretty much impossible to attract best of the best talent to, uh, to the company uh, unless uh, I think in my mind uh, currently maybe in the U.S., especially from the immigration uh, perspective and people's interest in coming to the country. And we, we cannot just have the, the, the just the, you know, people. We have to have the best of the best people. That's very critical because we're trying to do something almost pretty much impossible that no mind right mind will do. That's why big corporation will never take risks to do something like we're doing. If the reason why more than 60% of drugs approved by FDA these days are coming from small companies because they come up with crazy ideas that will never pass the joint decision-making process to give big corporation, pretty much insane ideas. But one out of maybe 1,000 or 10,000 companies may make it work, which sounded really, you know, kind of uh, whack or uh, out of the blue or whatever that is. So uh, I think it's pretty important to have that right kind of attraction of global talent to the, the region to 
be able to create company like us. And I hope someday Japan will be that type of country, but I think it requires not only the governmental uh, regulatory reforms, but also cultural change as well to allowing that um, difference, difference in opinion and respect that, not truly just accept it, but go beyond and respect that kind of other culture. That That is so critical. And I think I was lucky that I ended up starting a company in the United States by, by chance, basically. Thanks. successful in Japan, yeah. That's, yeah. that's really, really critical. And, and I, I could be wrong, but that's well, just my observation. <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> Maybe I, I would, don't have enough skills to do it. Maybe if yeah. better people can do it, but if, with yeah. my talent and my ability, I thought it was just an easier environment in the U.S. That's all I'm saying. Maybe you can do the same thing in, in Japan if you're creative, and I've seen so many great entrepreneurs in Japan, so <laughs> they must be much better talented people than I am, so they can do it. But for me, <laughs> uh, I'm just a physician, so maybe I needed a good environment. Yeah. And, and I would I would tend to agree that the talent the talent pool not just for the diversity of ideas but also for the execution is a, it's a critical factor of success. And I think Japan Japanese entrepreneurs and large corporations grossly underutilize the local yugakusei talent that the foreign exchange students are in Japan. Uh, I think as a, as this community this is a very international community here. Uh, and I, I think that there are certain categories, like robotics in the Osaka area, there are some aspects of biotechnology in some of the national, national universities that, um, with a little more you know, open-minded, integrative attitude, and you know, hopefully Mikitani-san and uh, Yanai-san's efforts to be more international in their headquarters uh, becomes more common in Japan. But I think there, there's a greatly underutilized resource in Japan uh, that um, it doesn't, in my mind, uh, in, automatically inherit that every, every company as innovative as, as yours would have to be started overseas. Uh, let's all take a uh, question from Mr. Tan and then, and then yours. Yeah, Ted Tan from Spring Singapore. Uh, we are a small and medium enterprise agency under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, something like uh, uh, Jetro here in, in Japan. Uh, we have been developing entrepreneurship innovation and um, I noticed that all our panelists are highly intelligent, highly educated, and full of fighting spirit and passion for your own businesses. My, my question, I have two questions. One is, uh, are entrepreneurs born or bred? And number two, is there any government agency, any government policies or support that you receive in your respective countries to help you in the success of your business? Thank you. I'll take the first one, just, just answer everybody. The answer is yes. They are born and they are bred. <laughs> uh, so if anyone has something like more serious you'd like to to address that but we did we we were going to we were going to be talking about you know government policies locally or nationally uh, and we didn't have to get so thank you for for asking that question anyone want to take that we take any of you want to take either question yeah government policies that are helpful or hindering to your business uh, whether local government or yeah, national. For, yeah, for, for, for starting a business, you need uh, some money to run your company. So, I mean, for uh, he is the, said that the Silicon Valley, it's easy to get a money to start your business. And uh, for investor, it's uh, easier to get return, right? You can go to the IPO of the Wall Street. It's, uh, the valuation of the company is very high. For Singapore and Korea has uh, some limitation for the kind of return of the, your investment. So the government tried to have uh, some fund for helping the uh, startup company to survive. But I think it's, uh, it, it is easy to start a business, but it's a more difficult one is to sustain your business, right? Sometimes you, well, for a startup company, uh, no one knows it's, going, it's a marketable or it's going to be sellable for, of your product. So for the time, at least two or three years, we have to survive for developing your technology. And you need some money from investor, but actually, yeah, it's, it's not easy for the uh, in an Asian country. So you, as ishigara san told us that we cannot do big business in this area. So intangible product like a software, contents, and patent, uh, law, consulting, the American company doing very well because they have uh, started their business targeting for uh, all over the world, right? So 
if I think that Japan has a, a lots of technology and it has also lots of capitals you can use. But as a, I, I, I travel a lot from Korea and Japan, I feel that Japan has a two, have a big domestic market. That is uh, also some problem for Japanese to go outside, right? So, but if you think uh, for future of the business is uh, for globalization of the my business or big company, because the oversupply of the product, right? Automotive, electronics. Uh, so you have to think about it going uh, global. So, I mean, the, how to get a I mean, ecosystem of the investment and return is going to be very important. Law, labor law, or other kind of thing, it's, it's not a big one it's a nowadays. It's going to be equalized over the world. FTA, TPA, is a bigger, and then a big difference among the country, I, I think. Can I say something? Yeah, um, yeah. I have some you know, strong opinion for you know, changing uh, you know, so law in Japan. And the one is, uh, well, you know, let's say, it is, so the, as I said, uh, you know, so the fund size in the United States is 20, 20 times as much as uh, total fund size uh, from venture capital in Japan. Um, you know, the government, you know, METI started, uh, you know, so the legislate uh, preferred stock, you know, several years ago. But, uh, well, preferred stock for this mean, uh, B, mean for BC is just, uh, you know, uh, liquidation preference and the governance. And the preferred stock for founder is just the price of the share. You know, in the United States, it is, we are allowed to, you know, pl uh, put a 10 times the price as much as um, the common stock. That means, you know, so for founder, without their, you know, own money, they can start up the big company. But in Japan, it is impossible. And, uh, you know, so the METI, okay, the legislator preferred stock. Then what happened, you know, so VC guys started putting the close of appraisal light in the contract. Appraisal light, what it, you know, basically means, you know, if they fail for IPO or M1 day, you know, you need pay me back. That is not investment. It is, you know, long. I just wanna, you know, government, you know, prohibited VC not naming them, them VC. It's just a bank. And I also, you know, so wanna, you know, change the labor law. In Japan, it is basically impossible to fire. So I don't wanna fire anyone, but I just wanna have authority to do it because we need to be a more, you know, we need to have a more agility. It's the speed is so important for company. You know, Japanese, you know, labor law is just uh, very old. And I also wanna have, uh, you know, so Japanese labor law um, is a programmer, is a hourly wage job. It is not. They are so creative. So law has to be changed. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I, I told, warned he's going to make the counterpoint that actually Ryo raised the $200 million for his company, even though it's based in Seattle, from only Japanese investors. So some some, some, sometimes for the right opportunity, the money is there. Uh, and in terms of government help, uh, INCJ, as a government fund to invest in startups, is taking a lot of flack because most of their money is not going to startups. But I happen to have been the beneficiary with, with the portfolio company working with Midokura, was close to going bankrupt, and INCJ saved them with a $10 million investment to give them the legs to go to the next level and to expand internationally. So there are, there are programs for the entrepreneur, an entrepreneur with the right passion, the diligence, and hard work to keep plugging away until they get that breakthrough. Uh, it's hard. It may be harder in Japan, but it's possible. Um, 
And I was, I was flipping through the Inc. magazine to actually give a serious answer to your question about bread versus uh, born. Uh, Inc. every year, when they have their 500 fastest growing startups in the US, ask the founders of the companies whether their parents were also entrepreneurs. And I was trying to get the exact percentage. It was 43% of the 500 fasting, fastest growing entrepreneurs in the US are the children of company owners, company founders. And my experience investing in Japan is also some of the most creative, uh, risk-taking, willing to try entrepreneurs are the children of company owners. So I think whether, whether it's the breeding and the raising the parents gave them, or whether it's in the genes, I think that's an open question. But uh, there, there definitely is, I think, a, a, a tendency for the people who take the risk and build big businesses to have seen it in their environment uh, growing up. So anyway, it was 43% of the Inc. 500 have, are the children of entrepreneurs. So, Greg. Yes, thank you, Greg's story. As an Australian, I really admire America because it's such an entrepreneurial culture. And when you look at the successful entrepreneurs, often they're on their fourth or fifth company that actually become successful because the other ones failed. And America has a tolerance societally to accept failure. And you're all very successful, and that's great. But I'm thinking about the future for Japan to create more global entrepreneurs, and I'm thinking that this culture doesn't have such an acceptance of failure. And I'm just wondering in your own companies how you deal with that issue about accepting failure and celebrating failure because as part of that creative, innovative process, you have to fail on the way through. So it's sort of a structural issue for Japan, from my point of view, in some ways. And if America's your model, uh, it's certainly got a good track record around having a celebration of failure and a tolerance for it. How do you do it in your companies, and what can this country do to start having a better attitude about failure to see innovation going forward and ultimate success? That's a great question. Who wants to take it first? Um, in our company, uh, we have uh, like a very rigorous uh, review process of uh, performance of the people that work for us. And during that review, we do it like uh, every quarter to uh, biannually, depending on the level. But uh, we always measure, have you made any good failure? I mean, there are, I think, two types of failures. That's good failure and bad failure. Bad failure, not like, you know, putting the detailed tension or you know, not gathering enough information at the time, all that, that, that's not acceptable failure. But the good failure is knowing the calculated risk and the potential upside and make the risk, uh, to, took the risk and, and still fail is a great example of good failure and we really foster that. If you're not making enough failure and, and that kind of basis, then you're not making enough, you're not pushing the envelope uh, as much. So we really, force people or encourage people to make that kind of uh, good mistakes. And that's in, in embedded in uh, culture, embedded in uh, uh, actual review process, and all throughout the company that, that is designed. So that we're very, very conscious about c consciously making uh, you know, cal risk calculated failure type of thing. Yes. Culturally, uh, what's the attitude toward trying and failing uh, in China and Korea? Is it considered very embarrassing or is it encouraged as an educational experience? Actually, it is not a culture. I think that in as a Ishimura san if you get uh, some money from uh, venture capital, Korea has a uh, uh, usually the CEO has a guaranteed hosho guaranteed the money. What I have to do IPO or I'm going to do something or I have to buy out some. Uh, there is uh, some. I mean, so it sounds like they copied the bad practice from yeah Japan. The, of the Japan. It's probably just going to be the same because. Yeah, so it, the CEOs should be have a, a huge re responsibility compared to their America. I think that they should be changed. I mean, for Japan and Korea, I don't know much about China, but when I was in U.S., it's very free to meet the venture capital and you get some money if you have a fail, or you, venture capital ask to sell your company to other venture capital or other capital market. But in I don't know. In Korea, it's very difficult. There is a is a is a main reason why the uh, nowadays uh, does not want to set up a company right for for me like me. So usually the company uh, start a company is kind of a, a people from the big company. They try to produce the part because they have a market. So it's easier to set up a company. But yeah, that that you have to change the rule and the finance. 
one. It's not a just an uh, embarrassing one. <laughs> so yeah. You're going to be a huge yeah. responsibility okay. after you have so a So the financial here. risk yeah. of failing is very big there. Uh, culturally, Mr. Lee, would you say that China, China as culturally uh, is uh, very supportive of people learning from failing uh, and failing and, and learning? Or is there a, like, like in Japan, a very, is it, to, is it very, very, it's too embarrassing to fail? So even educating children. Culturally, if you look at uh, Las Vegas, if you like, uh, come to Banco, you can, Chinese is a big population of gambling. <laughs> that, that is, uh, they're willing to take risk. So, so failing they, is? <laughs> yeah, that is a kind of culture. Uh, I think uh, if we're talking about the environment, uh, what is kind of, of course, a government uh, is very important. But this word is a flight. The money is uh, flowing in worldwide. If you make a good return, any location, a good return, that means that is the best environment for innovation. Talking about Israel, we invest a company in Israel. They have no market. They are a small country. But why we invest in there? A lot of capital in there. So I think uh, uh, many of uh, Asia countries need to learn something. Your country have a small population, but you can make a big return, and also now company is a cheap, it's a very expensive. In China also, so I started news of in Republic in 1996. Now it's uh, something 18 years old. We are IPO in Shanghai Stock Chain. Our PE average 25 times. The pink time is 80 times. It's, uh, you know, it's now young, it's now young company, not start up. So the reason is that every people looking at that is opportunity. And so I think that is a kind of environment, it's a culture and also not any independent company can make this. If I have uh, more money come to, from flu to Japan, that means they can make more return. If I come to China, they can make more return. So I think that the government need to think about. It's uh, my, my colleague here say, why they make, I think even in China for by tech, doing for the purpose to collect uh, got more talents. U.S. of course, no doubt, is good, good uh, the choice. Maybe China is a market, but not that. That is not a good place to do the research because you need the best, best. Maybe only two people, two people, you know, to make all the value of ninety nine percent. So it's uh, you have no no the choice. But uh, a lot of other business, for example, internet business in China. It's the best, best business, the value. We invite some company, they have no PE. So they, they lose a lot of money. They lose, you know, 500 million money, but they still can raise a lot of money so far. So just like uh, the story about Facebook, something happening in China, so. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, uh, specifically for Ishiguro-san, in your mission statement, you warn against succeeding, that uh, success is the worst thing that can happen to you, and you talk about how it's so dangerous to be successful, but you're obviously very successful now. So how do you maintain that spirit going forward? Yeah, um, it's, it's the statement, the in, best, in, the in, best in, predictor in of failure, statement? the best predictor of failure is okay. success. Is okay, in, in, in your, in your like. company website, on your vision statement, you talk about how it's terrible dangerous. it is to succeed. Well, it's yeah, very our dangerous. vision, you know, so we changed the vision, you know, so the, you know, the last year, our vision <laughs> is... <laughs> now it's okay to succeed. <laughs> no, 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 our current vision is uh, change myself and change the world. So I think that so the company having, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, innovative engine, some, uh, you know, power of change is very important to be a sustainable company. Mm -hmm. You know, we are still a small company, but we, st we already have uh, 14 years history. So we are a little bit growing. We have uh, 300, you know, employees. You know, so the way of, you know, so culturally, you know, we try to maintain, but we become a you know, medium-sized company and the speed is slowing down. So that's why we change the you know, vision. You know, so we have to change. You know, change yourself. Because we are B2B company, you know, so if I change myself a little bit, we change our client. We change the, you know, Japan. We change the world. That's our mission. In order to have uh, some you know, power of uh, change, I, 
you know, so I made an announcement in, the, in our company, how you change, you know, attitude, you know, culture, you know, innovative, you know, diversity, and, uh, you know, failure is most welcome. So, you know, these things I, you know, talk to my employee almost every day. Thank you. Uh, we are coming up on our lunchtime deadline. Um, and <clears throat> I had thought I would ask each uh, panelist to make one last remark, uh, but I think instead I'm going to just kind of wrap up if that's okay. If anyone has, I mean, they desperately have, have to get out, uh, we'll do that. But I, I think some, some of the, uh, first want to thank everyone for coming from Korea, China, Seattle, uh, and again, thank Globus for persuading such a distinguished group to come and share their experiences with us today. Um, the exposure to ideas other than your common sense that you grew up with and the open-mindedness to integrate uh, ideas from other side, I think, was a common theme today. Um, the, that the comment that Japan's environment for entrepreneurship is not uh, perhaps world class yet, but the very encouraging comments from Mr. Liu that an entrepreneur with passion and drive and the sense of urgency to get things done can build a successful business. The fact that our, our most successful entrepreneur on the panel raised not a penny in venture capital to build a 20,000 person global company, I think should be encouraging for Japanese with the drive and passion to do it. That uh, Sure, it's wonderful that a, a Facebook can come out of Japan, and, and I agree to build a platform company. A platform software company uh, maybe requires more capital than to begin with press services, but with passion, a vision, a drive, it can be done. And then the other, the other common thing of each of them in their experience is having some aspect of the world or the community they lived in that they, that they felt that they could personally make better by starting, the, the, the kind of coming back to the very beginning that, that entrepreneurship is all about uh, how, how a person, how a group of people can come together to make the world better in some way. And uh, kind of with, with that <clears throat> as their opening remarks, uh, I'd like to kind of close with that and the encouragement to all of those in the audience who are pursuing entrepreneurship. If you've been doing it for a long time, you can sometimes lose sight of the original vision, the original passion. And so for those who've been doing it for a long time, I would encourage you to, to think back on the early days uh, and your passion to change the world and what was it you were going to do to make the world a better place. And if you're just starting to remember that at the end, that's, that's what it's all about. That's what gets people to work with you. That's what makes it worthwhile. That's what gets uh, investors to back you. Uh, and uh, I think it's just as likely we'll continue to see uh, startups uh, growing uh, businesses that impact the whole world out of Asia and out of Japan. Uh, as anywhere else, and I look forward to this community continuing to be a key uh, driver and source of advice and encouragement and ideas to move the practice of entrepreneurship forward in Asia, and particularly here in, in Japan where we live. And, and thank you all for your time today and the, the excellent questions from the audience. And again, thank you to our distinguished panelists for, for making the effort to be here with us today. Thank you, thank you very much.